Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming along on this cool uh, Canberra evening and uh, spending some time with us at the National Security College to talk about uh, a really a really significant topic, uh, one on which we're very pleased to be contributing uh, to the debate, and that's migration and security, uh, rhetoric and reality. Um, now, at this point, I'll acknowledge the traditional owners of the land, uh, pay uh, my respects to the elders of Ngunnawal people past, past and present. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my, my name is Rory Medcalf. I'm the head of the National Security College here at the Australian National University. Um, and in a moment, um, I'll introduce our, our guest speaker for this public seminar that the National Security College is very pleased to host in partnership with the Crawford School of Public Policy and uh, other partners more widely. But I, I first want to mention some of the other institutions and people involved in supporting uh, Dr. Pelzer's visit to Australia, uh, including the Australian Demographic and Social Research Institute, the Crawford School itself, my own college, and the Australian Department of Immigration and Border Protection. Now, it's a real pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Khalid Kosa to the Australian National University, or back to the university, I should say, because um, for those of you who, um, who may may know Khalid and his work, he's, um, he's been here a number of times before in a number of capacities. Uh, he's here today, I think, in a particular capacity, which is the Executive Director of the, uh, the Global uh, Community Engagement and Resilience Fund. Now, this is a, uh, an initiative, a, a countering violent extremism initiative, I'd probably phrase it as best, uh, based in Geneva, but with wide international support, including, uh, I believe, from the Australian government, it's public private partnership, a global partnership, trying to enable the international community better to bolster grassroots efforts uh, against radicalisation, so to help support uh, communities, including through funding. Um, but our guest speaker is also uh, wearing a number of other hats, including as a non-resident fellow at the Lowy Institute, which um, I know well, my, my own former shop, uh, the Brookings Institution, Chatham House, and uh, Chair of the World Economic Forum's Global Agenda Council on Migration. So I wonder how many places you can be non-resident in at once, um, at once. Uh, but uh, you're certainly aiming for the, for the record and, and um, a significant academic appointment as well uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, now, as many of you know, uh, Khalid has published very widely on international migration over a long period of time, uh, including its nexus with security. Uh, and this has included some quite considerable field experience from Afghanistan to the Balkans to the Horn of Africa uh, and, uh, and uh, parts of Europe. His professional interests are very broad and range across irregular migration, immigration policy, the nexus between migration and security, and um, particular issues around the implementation of the Refugees Convention, counter-terrorism and radicalisation. Uh, in 2014, he was appointed a member of the Order of the British Empire for his services to refugees and asylum seekers in the UK, and um, as I've said, this is not his first visit to Australia at all, or his first visit to ANU. Uh, we've been pleased to host him here at the Crawford School and other capacities in the past, including with, in partnership with the, uh, the Department of Immigration and Border Protection. Now, um, today's topic, and I'll um, hand over to our speaker in just a moment, but today's topic is, of course, very timely, very relevant, given present political debates in this country and internationally on the uh, really the intersection of migration and security. And while I don't want to steal any of our speakers' thunder, I think it's really uh, interesting to note and um, our participation, both of us, last week in a conference in Sydney, a summit in Sydney on uh, countering violent extremism, uh, would remind us of this, that the relationship between irregular migration, uh, asylum, and the risk of importing terrorism is a very complex, a very fraught one. In particular, the relationship between, between migration and terrorism or migration and counter-terrorism is not at all a one-way traffic and there are very good arguments to be put as to why migration is in fact a big part of the solution uh, to, um, to terrorism or to countering terrorism. Um, our speaker will present for about 40 minutes or so and then we'll have a very interactive uh, discussion, I hope, a question and answer session. Please be ready with your questions and comments. Remember, we're on the record here, uh, so please take that into account. But at this point, please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Carly Cook. Rory, thank you for that immensely generous uh, introduction. Just to add to your list of the activities I currently undertake, I also chair a uh, working group for the World Bank on Migration and Security, and I edit the Journal of Refugee Studies. 
and I'm more than happy to take questions on any of those professional activities once this, this short, I hope, presentation um, is over. I'd like to pay, to pay special credit to Mari McAuliffe, who is somewhere in the audience who has helped coordinate my visit. I'm very grateful indeed to you, Mari. It's a real honour to have Peter Hughes here, someone I've admired and worked closely with and, and watched closely over the last 10 or 20 years, so thank you, Peter, for taking the time. Most of all, thanks to all of you. As you say, Rory, it's a cloudy, dark night, and I'm grateful that you've taken the time to come here. I will try to be brief because I want to hear from you. I'm here to learn from you as much as I hope that you might find what I'm saying uh, to be interesting. As Rory has indicated, this debate about the link between migration and security is certainly alive and well. If you look at what's happened over the last year or two globally, and I'm not here to speak about Australia, you can tell me about Australia, I'm here to speak globally. We've had the Ebola crisis, a clear link made between mobility, migration, trying to restrict movement of people in the hope that that would stop Ebola spreading around the world. I think a misjudged effort, but still clearly a link made between mobility, movement and disease. We've had the terrible outbreak of polio in a Syrian refugee camp. We have been for the last few years in the final mile of eradicating polio, only left in three parts of the world, northern Nigeria, Pakistan, Afghanistan. Now we have an outbreak within a refugee camp and very real concerns in Europe that sooner or later some of those refugees will try to get to Europe carrying polio. It's a great tragedy that we have missed that final mile on polio. We have what my friend and colleague, and many of you know him, Jeff Crisp, has described as military madness in the Mediterranean. A crisis evolving in the Mediterranean, boats crossing the Mediterranean, large numbers of people drowning in the Mediterranean, European response, militarise it, securitise it. I think clearly you know that a similar response has been taken here in Australia, three-star generals in charge of your border control. Sounds like a military solution or response to me. We have had from Libya clear indications that in the opinion of the Libyan authorities, IS, Islamic State, is now using boats to cross the Mediterranean to try to transport some of its fighters and terrorists across the Mediterranean. Big alarm bells, of course, ringing uh, in Europe. We have the whole phenomenon of foreign terrorist fighters, Australians as well as Brits and many other people making the seemingly incredible decision to go to Syria, to go to IS, uh, IS territory and to undertake some fairly ghastly activities um, uh, there. We have the Boston bombers and so on and so forth. So wherever you look, it seems to me the debate about the linkages between migration and migrants and security is alive uh, and well, I think rather depressingly. What I'd like to do, again quite briefly, and again perhaps drawing on some of my experience over the last 10 years or so working in this field, is simply offer a number of observations on this debate between migration and security. And I want to make five points. The first point I want to make is that I think it behoves us to engage with this debate however unpalatable we think the debate is. The second point I'm going to make is that even though I think we need to engage with the debate, I think we need to recognise the risks, the risks involved in securitising migration, because that is what is happening, and I think that process carries very significant risks. Nevertheless, I think we should engage. The third point that I want to make is that if we are going to engage with this hysteria, this, this media frenzy around migration and security, let's try to do it in an objective and analytical way. And I'll try to suggest to you a few elements of what an analytical framework might look like when we're trying to approach this idea of migration and security. Fourth point, let us, if not embrace, at least understand complexity. And I'll give you a few examples of how the link between migration and security is immensely complex and I think defies the simple analysis that all too often is taking place. And my final point this evening will be let us focus on the right risks. Because in my opinion, all too often we're focusing on the wrong risks when we speak about migration and security, and perhaps taking our eye off the real risks that, in my opinion, do uh, exist. So five points that I'll go through fairly briefly. The first point's about engaging. Um, many people, and I respect them and understand them, have said to me in the past, it is unpalatable, it is unethical, it is immoral, it is dangerous to even speak in public or write in public about the links between migration and security. You are risking feeding the media frenzy. You are risking fueling further misperceptions and misunderstandings of migration. Even to make this link in public is dangerous. I sympathise, I hear that argument, I understand the argument, but I'm fairly deeply philosophically against that argument. It seems to me that whether we like it or not, 
there is a live debate about migration and security. I've given you a, a handful of examples. There are many more that you might be able to give me from the Australian context and elsewhere. Most national security strategies in the world today, whether the UK's or Australia's, and Roy, of course, will know all of these, now mention migration and the movement of people as a potential risk. This is out there. The, the horse has left the stable. It's no point us regretting it or resenting it or thinking it's a shame it's happened. It has happened. It's out there. And it seems to me, as academics, as government officials, as members of society, as concerned people, as people who may well be pro-migration, it seems to me that it behoves us to engage with this debate. I think in this field, and I'm not sure that I would extend this to other fields necessarily, I think in this field, to not engage with your opponents simply because you think they are prejudiced or biased is almost as dangerous as holding those prejudices and biases yourself. It seems to me that we run a real risk in migration of a polarised debate, where you have two opposing poles, one that's pro-migration, one that, that's anti-migration, and the two simply don't talk. And one of my great regrets about the migration debate, and you can tell me whether this is true in Australia, but it's certainly true in Europe, is that we are losing the space for a sensible, objective, critical debate. Usually migration is good, sometimes there are risks. Some migrants come with uh, bad intentions, most migrants are hardworking people. Sometimes migration is a challenge to borders, normally it's fine and we should get on with it. We need the space to have that discussion, to say what's good, to say what's bad. And I think if we lose that space and can't have a sensible discussion, we shouldn't be surprised that our policymakers are losing control of this, this topic. We shouldn't be surprised that the media is filling the gap. So let's be sensible, let's be objective, let us engage however uncomfortable or unpalatable or difficult this discussion is. That's the first point I'd like to make. Having said that, my second point is, let us make no mistake, there is an enormous risk of securitizing migration. And I think that is what we are doing in Europe, and I think that's what, to an extent, you've done here in Australia around certain parts of the migration uh, spectrum. Three risks, I think, in securitizing migration. One is that what we have done is added to the further dilution of the concept of security. Now, I'm not a security studies person. I didn't train as a security studies person. But were I a security studies person, I would lament the fact that I no longer know what security means. Uh, hard security, soft security, human security, national security, climate security, demography and security, migration and security, food security, water security. It, it's no longer quite clear to me what the security concept is. It seems to me that that is a regrettable conceptual advance that we've made. And securitizing migration further muddies the security waters in my opinion. A second risk of securitizing migration is that we are, and I think this is happening, we are risking allocating responsibility for migration with the control, security, military, intelligence apparatus and parts of our governments. If you asked me where migration should lie in a government, I think it should lie with development. I think migration is largely about development and about making the world a richer and more wealthy place. And there's plenty of evidence that suggests that's largely true. Equally, of course, migration is a cross-cutting theme. You need labor market and health, and we know all of that stuff as well. But it does seem to me to be a mistake if we increasingly put migration into a security apparatus within our countries. And I think that's happening to some extent here, and again, certainly in Europe at the moment. But the third risk and the real risk of securitizing migration is this. If you securitize migration, if you portray migration as a threat to your country, you risk legitimizing extraordinary responses. And that is what we are doing. Now, we could have a, we're not going to do it, we could have an interesting debate here about waterboarding or extraordinary rendition or Guantanamo Bay. And I could say to you, um, my proposal is that in the name of protecting large numbers of innocent people against a terrorist attack, it is justifiable to trespass on human rights, to push the envelope, and to waterboard a couple of people and to keep 100 people out of judicial reach in Guantanamo Bay. Debate, yes or no, some of you would say absolutely not. Human rights are precious and must never be trespassed. Others might say, well, you know, there's a balance and a priority and so on and so forth. What I'm saying is, if you see something as a threat to your society and a threat to your security, it's easy to enter a debate where you begin to legitimize extraordinary responses. I think that's what you're doing in Australia. And I certainly think it's what we're doing in Europe. We are yes. using, thank you, we are using, we are using uh, military operations to try to turn back votes in the Mediterranean. We are in my country, the United Kingdom. I'm, I'm here to criticize Europe and not criticize Australia too much, at least, uh, perhaps in the, the Q&A. We are, in the UK, we are 
imprisoning asylum seekers in prisons with criminals, not people who have made administrative mistakes. We are putting children in adult prisons because there's nowhere else to put them. We are detaining people, I think, in an unnecessary and uh, unacceptable form, and this is just the United Kingdom. We are undoubtedly in the United Kingdom sending people back to countries where their lives are not absolutely safe. All sorts of ways where if you begin to portray something as a, as a threat to the state, you can then legitimise or at least have a discussion around some pretty extraordinary responses. And I think that's a real risk. So point number one, it's an unpalatable, difficult discussion. It behoves us to engage. Point number two, let us nevertheless recognise the risks of securitising migration. My third point is about an analytical framework. If we are going to do this, let's try to be analytical about it. I, I'm not going to do this and I'm not going to write a paper, but hopefully one or many of you will. What would an analytical framework look like when we discuss the links between migration and security? Well, firstly, I think we need to be much clearer about definitions, because when you speak about migration and security, all sorts of different definitions are thrown out there. Look at the migration side firstly. Are we talking about regular or irregular migration? Uh, Rory, you mentioned irregular migration. Most of the work is around irregular migration. Regular migrants, the Boston bombers, 9-11, it's also a regular migration challenge as well. What sorts of migrants are we speaking about? Are we speaking about internal or international migrants? Most of our concern is international migration. I would argue that the greatest migration-related threat is probably internal migration, massive urbanisation huge competition in labour markets, overcrowding, disease, food security in some of the big cities and some of the developing parts of the world. We don't really focus on internal migration and security. We tend to focus on international migration and, and our sort of global security and especially security in places like Europe uh, and Australia. Are we speaking about temporary or permanent migration? Uh, temporary migration, tourism, the underpants bomber so-called, he was a tourist. The 9-11 bombers were temporary migrants. The Boston bombers were permanent migrants. What are we talking about? Who are we concerned about when we speak about migration? Are we speaking about political or economic migration? Refugees or economic migrants? There's certainly a link between refugees and forced displacement and security. We had during the Rwanda crisis in the 1990s, genocide, people who had committed genocide in Rwanda who then moved into refugee camps to recoup, to mobilise, to get some food and went back in uh, to fight. Don't think there isn't a link between refugees and asylum seekers and security. Don't also think there isn't a link between economic migrants and people moving in other streams and security. So a lack of rigour on the definitions and the categories we're speaking about I think is a problem. You can say the same about security. Are we speaking about national security? Are we speaking about human security? What do we mean by national security? Is it about the safety of our citizens, a very hard, clear definition of security? Or is it about competition in the labour market? Or pressure on social welfares? Or welfare systems? Or environmental systems? Again, it seems to me a lack of rigour and a lack of clarity. So let's think about definitions if we're going to do this properly and understand who and what and in what circumstances we're having a discussion. I think a second part of an analytical framework would be to distinguish causes and consequences. It seems to me that you can certainly make a case that sometimes migration causes insecurity. Large numbers of people moving across a, an uncontrolled border in a fairly uncontrolled manner, uh, as we did, for example, during the crisis in Libya, in Tunisia, 60,000 people a day, clearly that causes insecurity. And I'm not talking about a few thousand people in a boat coming to a wealthy country like Australia. I'm talking about 60,000 people a day moving into a country that itself was undergoing a crisis and a revolution. There's no doubt at all that in certain circumstances, migration can cause insecurity. Equally, migration can cause security. I would argue that by and large, migration is positive for our economies and societies, and I suspect most of you would agree. Migrants are entrepreneurs, migrants expand the labour market, migrants tend to employ other people, migration tends to generate economic growth. So security, insecurity causes consequences. What about the other way around? Well, clearly insecurity causes migration. That's what refugees and IDPs are about. Equally, security can cause migration. This is the famous so-called development hump. If you develop a country for the first 20 years or so, there is more and not less migration because with development comes a disposable income, comes access to the internet, comes the ability to buy that ticket you've always wanted to buy to fly to Paris and so on and so forth. So let's be a little bit more analytical about causes, about consequences, about positive, about negative, really I think missing at the moment uh, in this uh, debate. Let's also recognise complexity. The language that is used in the migration security debate is so simplistic, push versus pull, positive versus negative, 
agency versus structure. It is just far more complex than that. And in a minute, I want to illustrate some of that complexity. And when we're thinking about policy, again, let's be analytical. Can we make direct policy interventions? Yes, sometimes. Yes, uh, other times, no, we clearly can't make direct policy interventions. Does policy have unintended consequences? Yes, absolutely, even though we can't plan ahead for it. So I'm not going to do it, and I'm not going to draw a picture, but it seems to me that we need to be much clearer about definitions, about causes and consequences, about short and long term, about the way that policy can and can't intervene, and about the entire complexity about this process. Because at the moment, this migration security debate is simply up in the air, and people are selecting what they want to make the arguments that they want, and I don't think that's satisfactory. A fourth point then, firstly engage, secondly recognise the risks, thirdly think this through in a fairly analytical uh, manner. My fourth point, and I only have two left, I want to keep roughly to time, is about complexity. And it's about getting away from some of these rather simple binary analyses and descriptions that we have about the relationship between migration and security. And let me illustrate these with three examples. If you spoke to, and I do this often with students in Europe, and you can tell me whether this, this would be the same here, if you speak to students in Europe and say to them, give me a couple of examples of how migration is a threat to national security, so not human security, and of course one is not here to underestimate the terrible hardship that migrants undertake, but I'm not talking about human security. Give me a couple of examples of how migration intersects with national security. Terrorism comes up often as one of the first answers. Criminality. Migrants are criminals, certainly comes up a lot in Europe. Health is coming up increasingly, especially after Ebola and the polio crisis and so on and so forth. Let's look at those, and let me just give you anecdotal examples of how the relationship can be more complex than that, again, rather binary equation. Terrorism and migration. If you force me to think about it, and I've thought about it, and give you an example of the best the clearest linkage between migration and terrorism in Europe in the last decade, I might well say to you Anders Breivik in Norway. This was a Norwegian who went to an island and slaughtered, I think, 71 people. And he slaughtered those people because they were part of a political party that believed in multiculturalism. Now, that's a very interesting and less binary take on the link between migration and terror. Those people died because multiculturalism exists. Those people died because there were migrants in Norway. They weren't migrants, they weren't directly supporting migrants, they weren't killed by migrants, but the existence of migration whipped up a hysteria amongst one sad or crazy guy and 71 people died in an outrageous terrorist attack. That's, I think, a more interesting, sophisticated analysis of the linkages between migrants and migration and terrorism than simply saying migrants are terrorists, and I've seen very little evidence at all to suggest that migrants are any more inclined to be terrorists than are any of our, our, our nationals. Let me give you another, again, anecdote around health that, again, just tries to illustrate the complexity and move beyond some of the, the, the simplicity that we sometimes see. Health, it is true, and it's clear, and the evidence is there, that in the UK, in London in particular, there are certain ethnic groups amongst which there are high preponderances of diseases, including infectious diseases. Why? Well, the research is pretty clear. The answer is not because they are dirty, or they come from poor countries, or they wipe their bottoms with their hands, or all the other stuff that you read about in newspapers. The main reason in London is because they do not and cannot engage with the public health system. If they are irregular migrants, and many of them are, they're too scared, scared to put their head above the parapet and engage with the health system because that would mean that they would then be exposed and possibly deported at some point. If you are a Muslim woman from Iraq who has spent your life wearing a burqa and you come to my general practice complaining of a stomach complaint, I, white suit, will tell you to take your clothes off because I need to investigate. You're not going to do that. There are very interesting pieces of research coming out of the UK at the moment saying that certain migrant groups, either because of legal status or because of cultural understandings, are not engaging as they should with the health system. So why is there a health risk around migrants? Not necessarily, again, because they are unhygienic or unhealthy or come from poor countries. It's because they are not engaging as they should and deserve to, and, and we, we need to promote their engagement with the health system. A third example, and again, I'm just picking out anecdotes that I hope will illustrate some of the complexity. This is a more difficult and, and nuanced picture than I think many people, or certainly the media and many politicians, understand. The third is around criminality, and this is the most difficult. Whenever I give 
any version of this presentation in Geneva, and you can tell me, and I'll be interested if anyone's brave enough to tell me, you can tell me what the answer is in Canberra, but in Geneva I always say, ladies and gentlemen, if, God forbid, you are mugged tonight at the central station in Geneva, you will not be mugged by a Swiss person. You will be mugged by someone from North Africa or the Balkans, and I can guarantee that's true. Now, that's a statement, it's out there, and it's basically supported by any evidence you can find in Geneva. Again, you tell me what the truth is in Melbourne or Canberra or, or Sydney, and let's see, if we can, let's see if we can have that open and critical a discussion. What I'm not saying is that all North Africans and all Balkans, people from the Balkans, are criminals. What I'm saying is there is a small group, and it's 20 or 30 people as it happens, in Geneva that are run by a gang master that pick pockets and break into cars and do a bit of beating people up and perhaps run a few drugs around that rather seedy area of Geneva around uh, the station. This is a difficult one to, to deal with. Firstly, you have to really encourage people to understand it's a small group. You shouldn't generalize into large questions about migrants and ethnicity and religion and so on and so forth. The other way we often try to deal with this, and I admit that we have failed, is to try to understand the context that is forcing people to do this. Migrants aren't intrinsically criminally minded. Migrants often do this because they have no alternative. The UK, for example, where we don't allow asylum seekers to access the labour market for six months, these are people who may owe money to smugglers, they may be under social pressure to send home money to their family, they turn to crime or petty criminality in order to fill some sort of gap. I'm not saying it's justifiable, I'm not necessarily accepting it, but I think understanding the context, the reasons, the drivers, the background, is one way to understand why some migrants some asylum seekers, perhaps some refugees, are turning to criminality in our societies. Now, sadly, that argument doesn't hold, especially with our friends in the media. Um, and I've done many interviews in the UK where I've tried to make that case, and of course the headline that comes out is, asylum seekers are criminals. That's, that's what you've told us. Forget the context, forget the background, what you're saying is this. And I'll, since this is a university, and since we're here, I guess, vaguely under the Chatham House rule, or I think we're being recorded, but I'll tell this story nevertheless. Um, I once did quite a nice piece of research, I thought it was a good piece of research, in the UK many years ago when I was an academic. And this was a, interviewing 100 asylum seekers in, in London. Um, it was a good piece of research, cleared by the Ethics Committee, uh, fine methodology, representative sample, we used interpreters, we triangulated the data, all the stuff that you'd expect of a, of a decent piece of research out of a decent university. And what did we find? We found that something like 70% of the people we had spoken to had, in one way or another, transgressed the law. Now, sometimes this is purely criminal, pickpocketing, sometimes more administrative. But we came to the conclusion, on the basis of a pretty good piece of research, a pretty solid piece of research, that the majority of asylum seekers with whom we had spoken had, in one way or another, and by the way, they were willing to admit it, had, in one way or another, transgressed uh, the law. Now, a professional researcher, which many of you, I'm sure, are, what do you do? You've done the research, it's defensible, it was a good methodology, you publish, of course you publish. That's the, that's the end goal that we're all working towards as academics. We didn't, because we knew that if we published, the Daily Mail, our particularly raggish right-wing newspaper in the UK, would publish the next day, esteemed academics confirm all asylum seekers are criminals. And it's a very interesting, almost ethical debate. What do you do when your personal feelings or politics or aspirations or, or desires run into conflict with what you are doing as a professional. And I don't know about you, but I've certainly met people working in immigration departments who have that challenge. I've met people in universities who have that challenge. Migration has become an area where we are increasingly conflicted. Our masters tell us to do one thing. We don't really want to feed the masters because we find it personally difficult. And, and there's something to be said around that. Anyway, my fourth point, let us, and these are very sort of obtuse examples, but let us just recognize that there is not a binary relationship between migration and security. It can be far more complex and nuanced and sophisticated than I think often uh, is understood. My fifth and final point is about focusing on the real risks. I regret the focus amongst my students and amongst many other people in Europe, again, on terror, on health, on crime. Firstly, because I think it runs the risk of being binary, as I've said. Secondly, because there is very little evidence at all to demonstrate to me, or to you for that matter, that migrants are any more likely to be terrorists or criminals or a health risk than are nationals amongst whom they settle. This is not empirically proven. There's lots of myths, rhetoric uh, around this. 
The other reason I think it's a mistake is I think it risks diverting our attention from the real risks around migration and security. Because much as I am pro-migration, much as I'm pro-asylum, much as, as Rory said, I have spent many years of my life dedicated to, the, to trying to support both refugees and asylum seekers concretely, but also an objective debate about them, I can still stand here and say to you that in my opinion, in certain circumstances, there is a risk that migration runs in some of our societies and states. And again, that's a statement that is all too hard to make in many places in Europe. And it's, this is what I mean about objective debate. I can, there, are, there are universities in the UK where I could stand and say what I've just said. In my opinion, in some circumstances, migration is a risk and is a threat to society and to the state. And people will be saying, you're a racist, it's outrageous. I'm not a racist. And I don't think it's particularly outrageous. I'm trying to share with you an evidential base that says that in certain exceptional circumstances, let's not generalise, let's not taint the entire population, but in certain circumstances, there is a link between migration and security. And if we can't say that and have that discussion, then again, I think we're in some trouble. Let me give you a couple of examples of where I think the real risk lies, and it's not terrorism, and it's not health, and I don't think it's crime. One is irregular migration writ large, the large-scale irregular migration. And I think this is a more than a conceptual point. It seems to me that we shouldn't expect too much any longer in this current day and age of our states, but one thing we should expect of our states is that they should be able to control the border and know who is and isn't on the territory and what those people are doing. And I think that's a reasonable thing to expect. And it seems to me that large-scale irregular migration is a threat to the exercise of state sovereignty. And again, I'm not talking about three or four, I, don't, I can't remember the last numbers, but a, a, a relatively modest number of people arriving by boat. What was it, a third of the Melbourne cricket ground would have been filled by, you know, let's get some perspective. I'm talking about large scale, 60,000 people a day crossing into Tunisia, uh, hundreds of thousands of people a day leaving Syria into Turkey and so on and so forth. It seems to me that where you can no longer control your borders because of large scale irregular migration, that is a genuine concern, and if you like, a genuine uh, threat. I think there's a case to be made that there are public security concerns around migration in certain circumstances. I can take you to places in London, uh, Geneva, many European cities. You can probably take me to the similar places in Melbourne and Sydney and who knows Canberra, where there is a concentration of prostitution, of drug running, of other illicit economies taking place, many of which are run on the back of migrants. Most of the prostitutes in, in the UK and certainly in Switzerland are migrants. And, and there are pockets in cities that are becoming increasingly unsafe and out of reach because of those activities. But note one thing that I'm saying. I'm not saying that the migrants are criminals. I'm saying that they are being exploited by criminals. That's an important distinction. But nevertheless, some linkage between parts of our cities, again in Europe, that, and certainly in North America, that are out of reach, that are increasingly unsafe, and the linkage with migration. I was in South Africa last week, certainly. Some of the areas in the big cities in South Africa that are increasingly out of reach are places where you have Zimbabweans and Mozambican settling uh, and in a very sort of disruptive manner. So public security concerns seems to me to be a more genuine and sensible link or argument to make when you're thinking about the links between migration and security. The big one, and I have confounded myself on this and I no longer know where I stand, is of course around integration. I think what I can say is that integration isn't working, or at least isn't working as effectively as we had hoped it would in places like Europe. The fact that you have third generation migrants, and I don't think they are migrants, frankly, the, 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 the grandson of someone who came from Pakistan 50 years ago, deciding to go off to Syria and cut people's heads off on camera, strikes me as firstly immensely stupid, and secondly, some sort of really deep fundamental failing of our society. What did we get so wrong? that even now, after 30 years, you're wearing your Manchester United football shirt, you went to a university in the UK, you are still doing this because somehow you feel alienated or disenfranchised or marginalised. There's something going on with integration. So I think there's a big debate, and we might have a discussion about integration and a failure of integration and how that is certainly destabilising. Let me give you a much more parochial example of integration and, and, and the way that it can and its failure can be a problem for society. I've got a good friend who is a school teacher in central London. And, and he's left wing and pro migrant I mean, my sort, of, my sort of guy, your sort of guy. Um, he says to me, teaching in this school was difficult 10 years ago because it was a class of 20 
and you had three Somalis. And that's kind of a challenge. You've got 17 English kids or, or British kids, and you've got three kids who come from a difficult background, who probably arrived as refugees, who have a different mother tongue at home, who are not fluent in English, who follow a different culture. You know, these kids are watching TV and understand whatever neighbours, our equivalent, EastEnders. These kids do something different. They have a prayer routine. They eat different food. It's kind of hard to make it work. He says, now what I have is a class of 20 with four English kids, uh, three Somalis, two Sri Lankans, there's a couple of Afghans, and a couple of Rohingya. And he says, I, can't, I can no longer manage the class. This has become an impossible class to teach. And don't be surprised that the middle-class English parents are taking their kids out of the school as quickly as possible, because migration has destroyed the education system in their eyes. This is it's very interesting. The, um, the, the left-wing, I was going to say liberal, but I know that's a different concept here, but the left-wing the left wing intelligentsia celebrate cosmopolitanism and transnationalism and diversity, I think on the coalface, diversity is really difficult to manage. And I think that school example is, is, a, is a reasonable example of that. A couple more, and I, I mean, I could go on and on, but a couple of more. The labor market. Now, we traditionally have understood that migrants tend not to compete in the labor market because the old line is that migrants either do work that we can't do because they're so highly skilled, they're, they're doing work that we're simply not skilled enough to do. Think about your Indian IT engineers and so on and so forth. All the work that we won't do because we consider it to be below us, it's dirty, dangerous, difficult, you know the sort of language. I think increasingly, and especially during a time of global recession that we're still going through, there is competition in the labour market between migrants and nationals, even away from those two extremes. And that's certainly generating a lot of the, the resentment and the xenophobia and the anti anti-immigration political traction that we're seeing in Europe at the moment. I think there is a challenge there, again, that needs to be analysed and thought about. Two more. One is the environment. I don't think it applies to our countries. It may, I mean, Australia is a, a fragile environment, but you don't have enough migrants, to, I don't think, to damage it. But, you know, to give you an example, I did my PhD in Malawi many, many years ago when one in three people in the country was a refugee. This was massive deforestation. This was a huge poisoning of the water table. This was irre 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 irrevocable damage to the environment. That seems to me to be a genuine thing, to lay at the door of migration. Large-scale migration, large-scale displacement can be a genuine, lasting threat to environmental security in some poor countries around the world. The final point I'd make on this before concluding, and I, I'm probably stretching the definition of security. One of my great concerns, and I think I see it in Australia, and I certainly see it again in, in, in Europe, the place I know best, another challenge that migration is posing is that the public no longer trusts the government to run migration. There is a draining of public confidence. I promise you, if you spoke to 100 people in the UK, and again, you can tell me whether it's true in Australia, if you spoke to 100 people in the UK and said, do you trust the government on migration, 80% would say no. The government has no idea what they are doing. It's out of control. There are hundreds of thousands arriving. They're carrying Ebola. They're committing crimes. They're stealing my hospital place. My kids can't get a decent education. I can't even get a house, and so on and so forth. There's a real sense, I think it's 90% wrong, but there's a real sense that the government has lost control of migration. And we will know, and, and Peter certainly will know, as a policymaker, as a politician, once you lose public confidence, it's very hard indeed to win it back. And the best way to win it back, of course, is to flex your muscles and to stop the votes and to send people home and to evict people and enforce and prosecute and persecute and so on and so forth. So I think we're getting in this vicious cycle. Public has lost confidence in the government. The government is overreacting to try to win back public confidence. We're in short three, four, five-year democratic cycles, and I think we're beginning to spin our wheels in, in rather a dangerous way. I could go on, but, but I don't want to bore you with any more anecdotes. Let me conclude. I think the migration security debate is alive and kicking. I think it behoves us to engage with the debate, however difficult or uncomfortable or unethical or immoral you might think it is. And you, I hope some of you disagree. I hope some of you think it was dangerous for me to even stand up and say this and it was a mistake. But I believe that we should engage. I believe that if we are going to engage, we equally need to recognize the risks entailed in securitizing migration. And I hope I've been clear that I see those as very significant risks, especially because we risk legitimizing extraordinary responses. 
I think if we're going to engage in this debate, we should try to do it in a far more analytical way than we have so far, and I look forward to someone doing And, and that's, by the way, another observation. There's very little research on migration and security. There's very little written about what I'm saying because it's become such a politically sensitive issue. I dare you to try and get a book published by Oxford University Press making the argument that I've just made. I think it would be very difficult. We are living in a politically correct, politically challenging climate where it's difficult to say, to say some of these things around some of these um, issues. Fourthly, complexity. I gave you three rather wacky examples about terrorism and health and crime, but the point is where migration and security are related, let's recognise that the, the links are complex. And finally, let us focus on the real risks. And in my opinion, they are not terror and crime and health. They're the more difficult issues around integration and public confidence and the environment and irregular migration and public security. That's where the debate, I think, should be, and that's where the policy focus should be. Thank you. I think you've, you've challenged us uh, in a, uh, a very both balanced and provocative way, uh, and I particularly appreciate that um, your point about the risks of securitising um, Securitising migration have been made under a banner of the National Security College. So um, there's a note of irony there. But I think I think one of the points of debate that we might engage in is is securitising a problem automatically a pathway to justifying extraordinary measures? Mm -hmm. Because uh, it would be nice if if um, security could be seen in, in an inclusive way as a way to actually encouraging wider community buy-in in the solution. But that's just a, a debating point maybe to throw into the conversation. I'll open the floor to questions and comments. Um, I've got one or two questions of my own, but I don't want to um, uh, monopolise. So I'll, I'll start perhaps with a comment or two from, or a question from the room. Thank you. Uh, my name's Shoba Vaki. I'm uh, an ex-UNHCR worker. I also live in Canberra, Australia for the last 35 years. Um, I agree with you completely. Uh, the media, the xenophobia, the ignorance, and the resource scarcity are causing these issues to flare up. If we had 30, 40 years ago, you come as a migrant to Australia, welcome with open arms, there's lots of food, there's lots of work, et cetera, et cetera. My questions are, we have 200 nationalities living in Australia. Why is it suddenly becoming an issue about migration? That's a question. I liked your definitions, and I wish we had clear definitions as people muddle it all up. What is a migrant? What is a refugee? And what is an asylum seeker? And people use them interchangeably, which is unfortunate. Dr. Koza, uh, if you stay longer, I'd like you, you to see how multiculturalism is thriving and well in Canberra. We have, as I said, 200 countries, people from 200 countries who live here. Um, IS and, and Al Qaeda, etc., they are using vulnerable youth young people and radicalizing them. What do you think of Australia's current um, issue with revoking citizenship? Um, when are the water and food wars going to start or have they already started? <laughs> and um, what can Australia do? Because this is all preventable and it's just, as I said earlier, that's what's causing thank it. So Thank you. We've well, got you. three questions there and I think that gives you the right to answer only one or two of them. <laughs> um, it is a, a, a very um, useful commentary, please. Shall I make a list yeah. or do you want to... Uh, take it, address it. Okay, you thank you. Yeah. Thanks. And I, I, I wish you could have a long... Com very briefly, I mean, there's a big... There's a, as you said, 30 or 40 years ago, people came to Australia and indeed Europe and were largely welcomed. And the concept is there was an interest convergence. It was in their interest to come, it was in our interest to take them. And what do we have to do to rebuild that interest convergence? And I think in Europe, and again, I'm not here to speak about Australia because I don't know Australia well enough and I don't come here often enough. Uh, in Europe, there is the potential for an interest convergence. We are facing a demographic time bomb. We need millions more workers. We need migrants. What are, migrants are young, fertile people who work hard. That is exactly what Europe needs. As I mentioned one of the things I do is work with, not work, voluntary work with the World Economic Forum. And most of our work is about trying to bring the private sector together with government. And the private sector in Europe is saying, please let us bring in millions of migrants. We need them. And your obsession with, and it's understandable, of course you've got a responsibility, but your obsession with security and visas and slowing down the process and bureaucracy and red tape means that we are losing out. So please, can we find a way to resolve that? So can we find a new form of interest convergence? I don't know, but 
we need to think about it. I think your point's really well taken. I had this debate with at least one person in this room earlier. Yes, are we talking about migrants as in people who have arrived during their lifetime, and indeed many of those have now become citizens, or are we talking about Australian citizens who's happened to have a grandmother who is Sri Lankan? And, and I think that's a really, I mean, in my analytical framework, that's a really important point, because I don't define, I'm the son of a migrant, but I don't define myself as a migrant. I have some sympathy towards migration, and, but I'm not a migrant. So if I go off the rails, I don't think it's a failure of migration. I think it's a failure of the UK, right. So I think we do need to make that distinction. Um, and again, I'm, we're on the record, so I'll be very careful. I don't know enough about the debate about the dual citizenship here, but I would say two things. It seems to me that a country has a responsibility towards its citizens. And secondly, it does seem to me that cutting out one part of citizenship and making this another country's problem isn't the most uh, charitable way to go. Thank you very much for your um, wonderful talk. Uh, my name is uh, Jeff Lazarus. I'm a school teacher, taught lots of uh, kids from, from migrant um, backgrounds. And I'd just like to sort of make the observation that uh, the problem in Australia um, is really more so in terms of refugees and attitudes towards refugees. And for many decades, Australia, I think, was a very successful multicultural society which was able to incorporate uh, different migrant groups sort of successfully, largely successfully, into the country. But the problem we have is in the last 20 or 30 years, and this applies to Europe, is that our major political parties seem to be influenced far too much by the sort of corporate sector. There's far too much transference of wealth going on to that sort of top 1%. And it's left a group of Australians who are on incomes of maybe 30,000 to 50,000, haven't got a good trade, not university sort of educated, experienced high levels of financial and economic insecurity. And that is the driver for a lot of the sort of racism in Australia, right? There's widespread racism in Australia, but it's actually very superficial and it's the financial economic insecurity which drives it. And I think, I suspect that it is the case in Europe um, even more so. And, and in a sort of funny way, you're talking about Europe and I'm thinking about Australia, reflecting on Australia, thinking, oh God, thank God we haven't got that problem. We haven't got this problem. We haven't got that problem. Um, but the potential is, is obviously there. But um, that wonderful work done by Professor Joseph Stiglitz and there's an economist at Oxford University has also brought a book out uh, on that type of analysis, I think it's, it's incredibly important as an underlying shape, shaping of people's attitudes and behaviour. Thank you. Will, uh, do you want to respond to that? No, I mean, just it's a, again, it's, a, it's helpful. I came here to learn from you about Australia, and that's a great insight into Australia. Uh, and this is not an Australian problem for sure. You, across Europe, from whatever, from Ireland to Poland, you can draw the line. There is a real rise of xenophobia, of... of anti-immigration sentiment, of let's be honest, anti-Islamic sentiment, this is, this is an Islamic issue, at least in, in, in my part of the world it is, uh, of political parties making huge capital out of this and of a real sense that Europe's in trouble. I mean, we are, the, 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 the left wing, the sensible debate on migration has been lost. And I think you're right, a lot of it is about nationals who feel that they're losing out and they haven't got enough money and so on and so forth, and I'm sure that's part of the process. Hi, Dr. Koza. Look, David Goyne, I was very taken by your point about a loss of faith in government, and I wonder if just the immigration sector is just a symptom of a much wider loss of faith in government right across the spectrum of government. It just strikes me that, you know, we've got this uh, switch to parties of the left or right at extremes in a way we would not have had 20 years ago because people have lost faith in the ability of government to manage their lives. Thanks. Um, so when I, I, I once, a couple of years ago, taught a group of American students, and I made this point that in my opinion, in your country, America, as well as in Europe, the public has lost confidence in the government on migration. How would you respond to that? And these students all said to me, we've lost confidence in the government to do anything, not just migration. As you say, migration is just a symptom. But what I would say, and I, and I, I, I reflect on this elsewhere, I think a, a mistake that migration policymakers make is not to learn lessons from other spheres of public policy. Um, because you, we have had food crises, we've had nuclear crises, we've had crises over all sorts of things where public confidence has drained away and has been recovered. It can be done. And I think it sort of behoves, if I'm right, and there is a draining of public confidence in migration, let's see how the Japanese public's confidence was rebuilt after that nuclear disaster. Let's see how Britain's belief in eating beef was rebuilt, even though we slaughtered every single cow because of mad cow disease and so on and so forth. It can be done. Let's see how it was done. And I think, I often think that migration people and policymakers don't look enough at, at other 
sectors to think about that. Uh, and I think you're, you know, you're largely right, and of course you'll know that the research published by the wonderful Oxford University Press, he says, looking straight at the camera. Um, <laughs> <laughs> increasingly, and this is true for migration, as in many other things, this is about cities. This is no longer about the, the state. And I think increasingly cities will become an important part of our governance structure in many issues, but especially around, my, mostly migrants go to cities. If there are problems, they're in cities. If there are benefits, they're in cities. Let's get the city mayors involved because that's where, that's where the action is, I think. Thanks, while we're waiting for another question from the group, and there is one up the back there, I'm just going to jump in um, with a, I guess a broader question about, um, about terrorism uh, and migration, but terrorism and multicultural societies. I think one of the risks that many of us see is not purely in the scale of a potential terrorist act, and often the casualty numbers are relatively small, but the impact on social cohesion. Mm -hmm. Now, in multicultural societies, whether it's Australia, whether it's United Kingdom, whether it's Europe or elsewhere, it would be interesting if you could make a comment on, I guess, how you see the link between uh, terrorism as a tool, as a tactic, and multicultural societies almost as a target. Uh, in other words, the target is tolerance and trust within a country. Um, now, how, how do you see governments managing the risk of the aftermath of terrorist attacks, maintaining social cohesion in the context of mm. migration? It's a, it's a, you're more expert than I, Rory, on this, and I haven't thought through it in much detail. I did once write a blog, I think for, for Lowy, where I said that far from migrants being the source of terrorism, migration is the way to stop terrorism because there's no better way to stop terrorism than multiculturalism. If we can generate understanding in our societies, then hopefully less people will go off the rails and become extremists and so on and so forth. So I see multiculturalism as part of the answer, not, not the other way around. I'm not sure that many, I don't know, but I'm not sure that many terrorist groups go out to attack multiculturalism. I think they might go out to attack our way of life and our standards and what we believe in and perhaps our particular religion, but I'm not sure multiculturalism is necessarily their target. Neither do I, and I hope I haven't been, been, I hope I haven't underestimated our public. I don't think the public fall for it. I don't think many people in the public, at least in, in the continent where I live in Europe, would, would make the mistake of saying that terrorism is a demonstration that multiculturalism somehow is a problem. I think most, most people celebrate, multi, celebrate multiculturalism and recognize that one or two terrorists are people who have gone gone off the rails. And let's not forget, you know, the, the, the great, and we, we, we haven't mentioned the work I'm doing for the Global Fund, the great burden of extremism and terrorism lies in Nigeria and Syria and Pakistan. The Charlie Hebdo attack was terrible and it killed 19 people. Your Lint Cafe attack was awful and it killed a handful of people. The burden of this is in often not multicultural, single culture places around, in other parts of the world. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um just a general member of the public, so I have nothing to announce before my question, but I was just curious about the idea of extraordinary measures and you know, the debate and how it can lead to that sort of being justified and particularly in reference to asylum seekers and refugees about what is maybe initially deemed as an extraordinary measure, but then slowly becomes normal as that sort of you know, becomes part of, I guess, the infrastructure. And I think, for example, offshore detention was perhaps at the beginning viewed as extraordinary and now has become sort of accepted as a tool in um, addressing asylum seekers and today you know there's been a lot of focus on direct payments to people smugglers and whether that took place and whether that's justified as an extraordinary measure to turn people back and deter irregular migration so I guess you know here extraordinary measures that definition of what is extraordinary keeps shifting as things become acceptable and I'm just curious that's happening here in Australia and there's been conversation that perhaps in Europe some of these policies might actually be copied um, to address some of the issues there. So I'm just curious to what you think about whether these are extraordinary anymore and whether you see that shift continuing as people sort of go down this ends justifies the means sort of logic, if I've articulated myself clearly. You have, superbly. Um, yes, I mean, one of, the, one of the realities of extraordinary measures is, is they become normalised fairly quickly. Uh, you know, I'm sure 10 years ago we were all up in arms about Guantanamo Bay. That was the, the poor example I used. And now it's just one of those things and, you know, President Obama promised to close the company, hasn't it? We understand why, and so we just kind of put up with it. And I, I, guess, I, I guess the same in Australia, you know, I'm sure there was, and I'm sure there still is huge outrage amongst advocates about some of these offshore processing and turn backs of boats and so on and so forth, but it's now policy and we kind of put up with it and it's off the headlines and so on and so forth. So not only, and I take your point, Rory, you know, securitization isn't, doesn't have to be a bad thing, but not only he, in this context is securitization risking legitimizing extraordinary responses, but those responses soon become 
accepted and absorbed and part of the commonplace, which means you have to go even further and ramp it up even further to try to make a difference. So the, the normalization of the extraordinary, I think, is, is, a, is a point. I don't know enough, and I don't think the evidence is there yet on this question of where the boats have been paid to go back, but if they are, it's a pretty astounding finding. So let's wait and see what happens there, because that's, that's, a, that's a pretty extraordinary response. We're paying criminals to take people whose lives are in risk back to a country where there isn't a protection system, I think, is an unfortunate thing. The, the, the final thing I'd say is there's been much, and I, you know, I'm in Geneva, and Geneva is rather critical of Australia, and many other places are. There's been a lot of attention on Australia, and I think Australia's policies have been rather extraordinary, but we have equally extraordinary responses in Europe as well. This isn't just an Australian issue. I think you've been more exposed or more extreme or more explicit about it, but, you know, uh, and I'm, I'm on the record, behind closed doors in Europe, lots of policymakers are quite jealous of what Australia is doing. We wish we could do it. Uh, thanks, Dr. Costa. Um, since the last change of government, we've seen the uh, settlement and uh, multicultural affairs functions of the Department of Immigration move over to the social services portfolio. And I was wondering from what you've seen internationally, is this part of a trend? Uh, and what do you think are the ramifications of such changes? It's nice to see you, Chris. Uh, thanks for the question. Um, again, I, I, I certainly don't know enough about what's happening in terms of the, the institutional changes here um, in Australia. I'll, let me just make a couple of non-Australian specific observations, uh, which may or may not apply to Australia. One is that you see, I think, around the world a sort of, uh, and I kind of, I think this is one of the risks of securitization I mentioned, a, a sort of a lack of clarity and a lack of consensus about where immigration and different parts of immigration, integration, immigration, social services lies. And I think there's a different, and, and there's, a, there's a, I think an unfortunate amount of change around the allocation of responsibilities from the institutions for these different parts. How you slice up migration, how you allocate it, I think changes quite often. One of the implications, European context, you can tell me whether it's true here or not, is a huge sense of insecurity and dissatisfaction amongst people working in those departments. And I, I, you know, I've, I remember giving a presentation to every head of immigration department in Europe, and I basically said to these, whatever it was, 25 men, I think they were all men, would you describe your departments as happy? Are your staff satisfied? And they basically said no. And, and so too much insecurity, too much change, too much political fiddling, I don't think it's, I don't think it's good for, 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 for morale, for confidence, for public servants doing what they're supposed to do. Thanks. Uh, one more question that I might um, ask you while we're waiting for another question from the floor, and this is about, about legal migration, about regular and legal migration, because um, a lot of the concerns that you've identified in changing political attitudes or changing social attitudes or securitisation um, obviously has a bearing on the way key countries respond to uh, irregular migration. How is it affecting their responses to or their management of legal migration? Uh, because, of course, there would be policymakers in Australia who would argue that, in fact, a greater emphasis can or should be placed on, um, on legal migration uh, to really substitute for um, large, large numbers of irregular migrants. Thanks. And, and I guess here I can speak about Australia. I think, you know, I would go out there and say that I think Australia is, a, is still a model and a champion on legal migration. I think you've got a, a legal migration system that is the envy of most of the world. Everyone always says Australia and Canada are the two kind of models, and there are criticisms, but they're out there. You do resettle refugees, which is, is I think, something that really needs to be reinforced. You may be treating asylum seekers in a, particularly, in a not particularly palatable way, but you are still I think the second or third largest resettlement country in the world. It's still not enough, by the way, but it's certainly more than the UK and any other European country. So I think Australia is good on legal migration and is making some difficult policies on irregular migration, and perhaps that's justified. In the European context, they are bleeding into one another. Mm -hmm. um, we have, I mean, we, you know, the European Union, free movement of labour. We have British parties on both sides of the spectrum lamenting the fact that so many Poles and Eastern Europeans are coming and working and paying taxes in the UK. This, so this xenophobia has lost its distinction. It's not just about irregular migrants or about the asylum seekers who are not genuine refugees. It's just a, a concern about migration in general. And I don't, I may be wrong, but I don't sense that in Australia yet, but I certainly do sense that in Europe. Yeah, I think there's probably less concern here about the, the payment of tax. 
taxes for cars. <laughs> no, look, that's, that's, um, that's, I guess, a useful point of context, and I, I certainly don't throw that in as a kind of a, a balance or a, or a defensive measure from an Australian policy point of view, but it's interesting to see that in some countries there's a risk of legal migration being challenged or threatened by the concerns that you raise, and that's something we obviously are very keen to avoid here. Um, we can take one or two more questions from the, the room before we, uh, we close proceedings, and I invite you all to join us for a, a drink afterwards. So please, if there's any more, um, there's uh, one, one uh, lady up the back. Thank you. Do you think migration poses much of a risk to gender equality in Western societies? Um, thank you. It's a great question. <laughs> I, I haven't thought about it. I mean, if what you're I guess what you're suggesting is that some migrants come from patriarchal societies and, and are not respecting women's rights even when they settle in our countries. I, 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 is, I imagine what you're suggesting, and it's absolutely a problem. I mean, the, again, in the UK and in, in the European context it is. We have, a, we have migrants coming from pretty patriarchal, pretty difficult societies and not adjusting quickly enough to what our standards and way of living is. And, you know, I'm very strong on this. Integration is a two-way process. You, the migrant, have got to make as much effort as I, the state. And, you know, and without being very crass about this, if you're coming as a, as a guest or even a refugee, then I expect you to make the effort. I expect you to certainly obey the law. I expect you to make the effort to learn the language. And I expect you to make the effort to, to you know, not give up your culture. I'm not, I, I don't want you to, uh, the French model of assimilation, I don't want you to become a French person. I don't think that's the, the way to go. But at least I expect you to, to understand and sympathise and, and behave in a way that I consider to be, and my country considers to be decent. So no female gentle mutilation. No, no, educate your children. Make sure that women have the right to go to work and leave the house and those sorts of things. And it is a problem. I mean, I don't think it's a huge problem in, in, in the UK, but there is, there is an element of that, yeah. Thank you. Look, if there are no more questions from the, um, from the group, I'll, um, I'll call proceedings to a close. Uh, Dr. Kelso, that was a really, I think, illuminating and uh, provocative presentation, as we hoped and expected. Um, we, uh, we'll take that away and we, we, uh, we hope it will uh, have it play its part in wider research thinking and policy debate in this country. I'm very pleased that the National Security College has had the opportunity to work with the Crawford School and other hosts of your visit in, in convening this event today. We look forward to you joining us all for a drink uh, and to meet uh, our audience shortly. But uh, friends and colleagues, I want to now invite you all uh, in particular to, um, to show your appreciation of today's event and please join us for a drink. Thank you.